Thrill me. Hey, Guru, when are you going to review Night of the Creeps? When am I going to review Night of the Creeps? Yeah! I'll tell you when I go review Night of the Creeps. Hell yeah! I'm going to review Night of the Creeps right after I take this shit. Oh, oh, oh here comes the moby shit! Ah! Ah, oh, there we go. I can do the review now. Night of the Creeps. The good news is your dates are here. The bad news is they're dead. And here I thought the bad news was the bears, but I suppose that's an all too common misconception. But what isn't a misconception is apparently this flick's got two taglines for the price of one. I'm not so sure about this second one though. If you scream, you're dead. Well, not to be that guy or anything, but I'm pretty sure Wes Craven proved you get at least four screams before death. Night of the Creeps is a 1986 horror comedy written and directed by Fred Decker, the man behind the brilliant Monster Squad, or as I like to call it, Goonies for Gorehounds. Personally, I owe a great chunk of my childhood to Mr. Decker, as Monster Squad was what got me into Universal Monsters in the first place. I mean, a bunch of kids fighting Dracula and the Wolfman? There is no better gateway drug than that. And this week's film had a similar impact on me, but we'll touch on that more later. For now, just strap on that flamethrower and get ready to roast some frat boys, because this week's Creepy Crawly Creeper feature is none other than Night of the Creeps. Right off the bat, I love the fuck out of this title sequence. It's a straight up homage to old school horror magazines such as Famous Monsters of Filmland. It's pure 50s B-movie nostalgia, but with an 80s flair and perfectly sets the tone for what's to come. Whoa, look at Xeno Dorkless here. It's like he's participating in the world's smallest marathon where the grand prize is no doubt a replacement for his Ken doll dick. Anyway, Xeno Baggins here releases a mysterious canister into space, much to the chagrin of his pursuers, who apparently all speak in really shitty fan subs. Following that, we then space pan to Sorority Row 1959. Ah yes, the prequel to Sorority Row 2009 we all clearly asked for. Joking aside, this opening is a good example of the nostalgia I mentioned earlier. Because not only does it take place in the 1950s, it also mimics its filmmaking style right down to the black and white photography. But enough history lessons as we're introduced to Johnny and Pam, who don't quite seem to get the point of Make Out Point. Unfortunately for them, Ricky Cop Ray does understand, as he is Pam's ex-boyfriend. Ooh, ouch. Talk about some harsh rejection. Pam? Hello, Ray. Yeah, fuck off, you perfectly nice dude who I've apparently dumped for having an important job. Oh, come on, Muffy. The guy's a cop. He has no future. Seriously, Ray, I think you can do better than this bitch. Whoa, shit, look out! It's the War of the Invading Blobs from Outer Ghidorah! Anyway, the couple tracks the meteor down, where Johnny abandons his girlfriend, proving that chivalry is indeed dead despite the many hours I've poured into it. This proves an especially bad idea, however, as not only is Johnny mouth-raped by the spawn of Lavos, he also left Pam to the homicidal whims of an axe-wielding maniac. Jesus, he chopped her head so hard it cut to the 80s. This opening is one of my favorites because within it, two distinct eras of horror successfully collide. Kind of like a pegging that also comes with a reach around. I'm depressed. Depressed? It's a bit early for that, Kurt Cobain. It's not going to be the 90s for at least another four years. So these whiny Romeos are Chris Romero and James Carpenter Hooper, both of whom's names are direct references to the genre filmmakers that inspired the making of this film. Face it, JC, we're dorks, we're lame whites. My grandparents have sex more than we do. You keep track of your grandma's sex life? I thought I was the only one. Chris sees a really pretty girl at a frat party, but is too much of a whiny little bitch to do anything. Thankfully, much like this random bra, James is nothing if not supportive. Cindy. 
Cindy what? This is what I really love about James. He's partially the comic relief, but more importantly, he's also a really good friend who will not hesitate to stick his neck out when his buddy needs it. Cynthia Cronenberg. Oh shit, it's the daughter of David Cronenberg. At that point, I get the fuck out of Dodge, as best case scenario, she'll infect you with a mutant fuck slug. Not that it matters, though. As it turns out, Cynthia is dating another man. Possibly a caveman. Hey, you're cruising, man. I wouldn't say he's cruising, but he's definitely looking for a French connection. And now it's time for some wacky 80s hijinks, because this is a 1980s movie after all. So Chris convinces a very skeptical James that in order to impress Cynthia, they must first join the Beta Fraternity, which of course only makes sense if you're using a really ass-backwards definition of the word sense. What makes you guys think you're Beta material? Look dude, your frat is called the Betas? I'm not sure you're in a position to be picky. So it turns out, in order to join the betas, our losers must first steal a cadaver for a pledge prank. This amazingly leads them to a cryogenic chamber by some stroke of luck, and the chamber just so happens to contain Johnny from 1959. They stupidly unfreeze him, but of course he reanimates and scares the shit out of our zeros. Ooh, mouth-to-mouth -mouth regurgitation! This really is college all over again! But enough relatable social interactions, because it's time we met the real star of this movie. The man, the myth, the mustache, Tom motherfucking Atkins. Seriously, just look at this guy. He's cooler than cool. He's fucking frostbitten. And it turns out he's actually Detective Ray Cameron, the former rookie cop from the opening scene. Man, that Atkins diet really works wonders. This is all your fault. I can go to the beach now. Unfortunately though, it turns out Ray never really got over Pam's murder. That or he has very confusing romantic feelings for the Crypt Keeper. Seriously though, Tom Atkins is my favorite character actor, having appeared in everything from Escape from New York to Halloween 3 to even Drive Angry. But his best role, bar none, this movie. Why? Two words. Real me. I wish I responded to everything with that same level of badassery. Hey, dipshit! You forgot to pay the electric again! Bill me! Hey, Guru! How you want your chicken cooked? Grill me! Resident Evil! Kill me. Cameron is called in to the scene of the cryo break-in where he's informed of Johnny's missing body. Side note, but the cop he chews out here? He's Sergeant Raimi, as in Director Sam Raimi. Hmm, I'm starting to notice a pattern here. First, knock out the yes sir shit. Second, since when does a desk sergeant show up on a call? Huh? Oh shit, Alpha Stash is self-aware. I repeat, Alpha Stash is self-aware. What is this, a homicide or a bad B movie? Mother of God! Reality has been breached! Initiating O'Bannon containment procedure! Back on Sorority Row, Cynthia returns from a rather disappointing date with Sweater Vest Brad, who it turns out is her real boyfriend and not the Cro-Mag from before. But in a strange twist of events, one of her sorority sisters asks her where she can store jars of human brains. The fuck? How about the basement? I just don't want them up here. <laughs> don't worry, Cynthia. It's an 80s sorority. There are no brains above the ground level. Whoa, I can see clearly now her bra is gone. Unfortunately for all of us, the glorious nudity is cut short by... <laughs> Jumpy! There you are! Slasher, the fuck you doing here? Was Jumpy, a jump scare cat. He likes to hide in movies and scare unsuspecting teens. <laughs> it's been his thing ever since he killed Rat Dulu. Oh, oh, Jumpy, what have you done? Oh, the great old ones are gonna have our minds for this. Oh, 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 oh. I'm very disappointed in you, ass slasher. <laughs> 
No, Cynthia, don't look out there. Them's Michael Myers' country, and by that I mean the California suburbs doubling for everywhere USA. Dude, what are you smiling for? There are slugs in your brain! Wait, no. Creeps, not slugs. That's an entirely different movie. Detective Cameron arrives on the scene, and I really like how unlike all the other officers, he drives a much older car. It just nails home the idea that this is a man stuck way in the past. Speaking of which, it appears, much like this movie's critics, poor old Johnny was split right down the middle. This proves too much for Cameron, whose triggering intensifies, leading to a flashback of him burying a dead body. That looked to you like it, uh, like it could have been done with an axe. I said, stop it. That psycho disappeared 27 years ago, and you know it. True, but it could still be an entirely different axe murderer. You ever think of that, detective? Wait, the fuck? <laughs> Headless corpse found? Last I checked, he still had a head, his face was just an ass crack. Then again, I'm not sure why I'm expecting journalistic integrity from Roger Corman University. Whoa, watch out guys, it's Huey Lewis and the Tools! Sweater Vest Brad, seen here without Sweater Vest, assumes Johnny's body was put there by James and Chris, which leads to a confrontation Cynthia is none too pleased with. After that, our losers catch the eye of a different sort of bully, the Los Angeles Police Department. Christopher Romero and James Carpenter Hooper, Landers, homicide. Landis? As in John Landis of American Werewolf in London? Is it just me, or are these names starting to sound like the most awesome convention lineup ever? And if you thought that naming scheme was gonna end there, you'd be mistaken, as the very next scene we're introduced to a janitor named Mr. Minor, as in Steve Minor, the director of House. Who, um, also works the second unit of this film, by the way. Later that night, Toe-Tag and Earl here rises from a gurney and escapes the most oblivious police station I have ever seen. <laughs> Jesus, look at those nostrils! In honor of its leading discoverer, Jean-Marie Chauvet, the cave now bears the name Chauvet Cave. Meanwhile, back on campus, the creeps be creepin'. The creep effects were done in a variety of ways. Some were motorized, some were pulled on strings, and quite a few were recorded in reverse so as to give them a more unnatural quality. It looks like Leisure Suit Laura's about to learn why you never let a cat jump you twice. Hi, Igor. Jumpy! No! What did they do to you? They kinda zombied him. Wait right there, Jumpy! Daddy's gonna fix this the only way he knows how! By slashing! <laughs> oh, I'm only making it worse! After a fight with Sweater Vest Brad, Cynthia tells Chris about Johnny's exploding head. James thinks she's nuts, but leaves Chris to get his Mac on anyway because he's that good a friend. Unfortunately for him, though, the creeps don't appreciate this quality as much as I do. Okay, this part never really made sense to me. Like, if I saw that thing spazzing about, my first instinct would not be to set it on fire. I mean, it's important he does this on a plot level, but it just seems wrong. <laughs> and don't even get me started on that Striper Rules graffiti. I don't care if one of their girlfriends worked on this film. The only thing Striper Rules is my taint. Anyway, James is Chinese finger trapped by the creeps while Chris is stalked by Detective Cameron. Which leads to my absolute favorite scene in the whole movie, Cameron confessing to Chris that he tracked down the axe murderer from the opening, killed him in cold blood, and buried him behind the sorority. But it's not that reveal that makes the scene, it's the way Atkins plays the confession that gives me goosebumps every time. He starts off so matter-of-fact, explaining how he found his sweetheart's mutilated remains. But then when he talks about revenge, he smiles and chokes up a bit, as even he can't handle his own bloodlust. And finally, he gets so lost in his own tale, he doesn't even register Chris's questions anymore. Spanky, guess what happened next? Should you be telling me this? Close. I pulled the trigger. 
It's a perfect performance, and is the true reason I consider this Tom Atkins's finest role. Unfortunately, it turns out the house mother's cottage now resides in the exact same spot Karen buried the axe murderer. Remember kids, accidents are the cause in one in four senior deaths, so chop responsibly. Cameron is immediately called in and takes charge like a fucking badass. Wallace and Teague are in the patrol car. Dante and Detective. De Palma relax, the relax. Road. I could be wrong, but Wallace and Teague might be a reference to directors Tommy Lee Wallace and Louis Teague, while Dante and De Palma is probably referencing Joe Dante and Brian De Palma. But don't quote me on that. Except please do, because that's totally the case. I just love the design of this zombie. It's like something straight out of EC Comics. I especially like the way it smiles as if it recognizes Cameron. Anyway, Cameron blows the zombie's mind, quite literally, while the betas prepare for a formal dance in a montage ripped straight out of Carrie. I'm honestly not sure if this chick's hair is dry or if the 80s hair products repel any and all hydration. But what I am sure about is James leaves Chris a message explaining that the slugs Cynthia warned them about are real and that they're killing him from the inside. I walked, Chris. All by myself, I walked. I love you. This is another great scene because you can really feel the loss and grief, mainly due to Jason Lively's heart-wrenching performance. A performance achieved, by the way, as the director put photographs of the Holocaust just off screen for Lively to stare at as the scene played out. In fact, you can even see one of them right here. Holy shit. Anyway, Chris seeks Cameron's help, who apparently caught the doors on tape. Actually, that tape is a subtle indication of something the movie never outright tells us, but shows us brilliantly. First, we see Cameron playing with his lighter, and then when he answers the door, it's mysteriously covered in tape. Once Chris explains that he needs Cameron's help, Cameron gears up, and all the while, the camera slowly pushes into the oven. Then when he turns it off, that's when we realize we've been hearing the subtle hissing of gas the entire scene. Because as it turns out, had Chris not arrived, this would have been a suicide attempt. It's so simple, but handled with the grace of a master. Seriously, why wasn't this a big hit when it came out again? Back at the Beta House, the frat boys board the Extra Wide Bang Bus. Hey Cunningham, where's Brad, man? Hey Cunningham, as in Sean Cunningham of Friday the 13th fame. The nuds just keep on coming. As far as where Brad is, turns out he's in the doghouse, or the dog's mouth as it were. Also, apparently Discount Angus Young is a terrible bus driver. Pretty good at Mad Max references, though. Back at the police station, Cameron takes Chris to the weapons locker where we're introduced to Walt, played by none other than Dick Miller. Jeez, to tell you the truth, Ray, that could be a little problem. That could be a little problem. Dick's actually played a character named Walter Paisley in multiple films such as A Bucket of Blood, The Howling, and even Chopping Mall, so I have a suspicion that's why he's named Walt here. In fact, IMDb even listed as the same character, so there you go. To get back to the movie, Cynthia shoegazes too much to notice her boyfriend's been creeping for the past five minutes. Don't worry though, our heroes arrive just in time to give Brad the sick burn he deserves. Finally, the Skeletor origin story nobody asked for! Once inside, Cameron battens down the hatches while the zombies close in. This leads to the iconic poster line... The good news is your dates are here. What's the bad news? They're dead. But the best news is this'll look great for the trailer. The zombies assault the sorority, but thankfully our heroes have played way too much Left 4 Dead 2. <laughs> They're really mowing these fuckers down, aren't they? Meanwhile, Detective Cameron is still inside, wrecking the shit out of everybody. Play of the game. Throw me. <laughs> 
Cynthia realizes the creeps are going for the brains in the basement, and it's at this point we see the completion of Chris's arc, as he fully digivolves from whiny sad sack into Detective Cameron himself. Once downstairs, the couple finds Cameron preparing to Vietnam Tim Burton's mutant slug collection. I fucking love that wink, because it's basically Cameron congratulating Chris for having saved the girl, the very thing Cameron failed to do in the past. Anyway, Cynthia and Chris run outside as Cameron finishes his countdown, where Chris steals Cameron's iconic line, Detective, thrill me. we've officially reached the difference between the director's cut and the theatrical. You see, in the studio cut, the dog from earlier bagools the shit out of Cynthia and Chris. But in the director's cut, a roasted Cameron crawls out of the wreckage, releases creeps into a graveyard, and the aliens arrive 30 years too late. Like some straight up Star Wars shit, it's fucking great. The studio didn't understand the original ending, so they forced a cliché one, which was terrible because the original ending is way more memorable. But, oh well. Night of the Creeps is a fun, tightly paced throwback that I love just as much growing up as I do now. It's also the perfect entry point for two decades of horror, and very few films can claim that. Sure, there are a few things that don't quite add up, and the movie is cheesy as all hell, but that cheese is about as delicious as Five Guys Burgers and Fries. And let's not forget that this is the movie that solidified Tom Atkins' cult status, and where would we be without that glorious mustache? Like, seriously. Anyway, my fellow gorehounds, I've said all I really need to say about this gem, so if you'll excuse me, I've got some unfinished business to attend to. Oh, Jill, you are the most bootylicious of the zombie slayers. Oh, hey, Jumpy. Oh, you survived the zombification process, I see. You're looking a little pale, though. Have you lost weight? Oh man, somebody call the vet! Jumpy's got worms again! Oh no! Guru! You're a zombie now! Oh, it's like my seventh movie all over again! Oh! Thrill me. Miller time. Thanks, Tom Atkins, mustache! Pull up a chair, deep in the crib, from a blood red chair, and you must take a This episode was brought to you by these amazing Blood Splattered Patrons. If you'd like to become a patron yourself, click on the Patreon button in the corner and help assist Blood Splattered Cinema get bigger and better. And I'm not just talking about my waistline. This opening is one of my favorites because within it, two distinct eras of horror successfully collide. Kind of like a pegging that also comes with a reach around. <laughs> Greetings, my fellow gorehounds, and thank you for tuning in for another exciting episode of Blood Splattered Cinema, where I put the laughter back into slaughter. As per usual, like, comment, subscribe, and if you happen to make it this far into the video, then do me a favor and leave a comment below with the movie you would like me to review next. And if you happen to see someone already commented with the movie you want to see, then thumbs up that comment so I can get a good gauge on what you all want to see from me in the coming year. And with that all said, peace out my fellow gorehounds, and I'll catch y'all later.
Gotta catch y'all, gotta catch y'all. Gotta catch y'all, gotta catch y'all. Guru Mon!